The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. What would the Lord prefer? That we make our decisions based on all kinds of supernatural signs and miracles and evidence or because He says so in His Word and we have absolute confidence in His Word? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Our message today is going to be on the subject of signs and wonders. Miracles, signs and wonders are all through the Bible. God often uses them to demonstrate His power. Deuteronomy 24 verse 10 But since then there is not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. Have you ever prayed you could see God face to face? In all the signs and wonders which he did when he sent him to the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all the land by that mighty power and all the great terror that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. You know, miracles of course are when you see something extraordinary or unusual out of the ordinary happen that seems to violate the regular laws of um, science and uh, probability. But really we're surrounded by miracles all the time. Someone once said the world is not lacking in wonders, we're lacking in a sense of wonder. It's amazing when you think about all the cars that you drive by and what people do in their cars that you make it anywhere safely. I mean, we're just surrounded by the evidence of God's protection. Now, is it wrong to want to see miracles? Well, have you ever prayed you could see an angel? Be honest. Have you ever thought, Lord, people in the Bible saw angels. People in the Bible saw miracles. I, I want more faith. If I could see more miracles, I'd have more faith. Lord, just a little miracle. And that's kind of normal, I think, for us to sometimes want that. I didn't see very much response, but I'm guessing some of you have thought that way. Come on, help me out. How many of you have thought that before? Have you prayed, Lord, could I see an angel? Gideon had the same challenge. When the angel appeared to Gideon, and he called him a mighty man of God, he said, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why has all this befallen us? They were being subjugated by the Midianites. And where are all the miracles that our fathers told us of? I always like this verse where Gideon says, What happened to all the miracles? Have you ever thought today, I read about all these miracles in the Bible, where'd they all go? Did God stop doing miracles? Did the store close? What happened to all the miracles? And here you've got Gideon, who lives before the miracles of Elijah and Jesus and the apostles, and he says, I guess the age of miracles is over. So evidently miracles and signs and wonders seem to come in cycles and in waves. Did God do some miracles for Gideon? And then Gideon, of course, he not only saw some miracles, he asked for signs. Before he was going to take this little group into battle uh, against the massive force, he said, Lord, I don't want to go on a suicide mission and just be hallucinating, thinking I heard you speak to me. I really want to know before I lead all these men into battle and risk their lives, this is what you want. And that's where you got the, the story, and by the way, you read about this in Judges 6, verse 37 through 40, of the fleece. I want a sign, Lord. It's a big decision, so I'm going to throw out a fleece. And a fleece, of course, is the sheepskin. And he rolled it out on the ground. They probably used it as bedding. And he said, you know, I'm going to pray the first time and in the morning if the dew is on the fleece but not on the ground, I'll take that as a sign from you. So God did it for him. And then he thought, well, maybe that was a natural occurrence and it wasn't really a miracle. Have you ever wondered, is something a sign from God or was it just a coincidence of nature? And you just didn't understand the coincidence. So he said, all right, Lord, maybe I've got my, my physics backwards and that was perfectly normal. Now I want it the other way around. I want the dew on the ground and nothing on the fleece. And God did it again. He said, okay, that's enough. And based on those signs, he felt some confidence. When Moses went to the Pharaoh, he said, they're never going to believe me. What shall I do? What sign 
will I give them so that they can believe? And God said, well, you want a sign? I'll give you a sign. Throw your rod down and it'll turn into a serpent. Put your hand in your breast, pull it out again, it'll be leprous. Put it back in again, pull it out again, it'll be healed. You remember that? Because people back then were so used to measuring the power of God by what kind of signs can you show me? Can your God do signs? Can He perform miracles? That was very common back then. Now with that as a backdrop, this is the main thing I want to talk about. It's the story of the nobleman of Cana. I don't think I've ever preached specifically on this and I should give my dear wife some credit. She was reading this story this week and started talking to me about it and I thought, that's a good subject for a sermon. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 4. The nobleman of Cana doesn't tell us his name. He evidently had a position in the court of King Herod. He was a Jew, but he was a, a man of high station, wealthy. And you find this in John 4 verse 46. It's the last story in John chapter 4. It's also important to remember that in John chapter 4 you've got Jesus meeting the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And all these people in Samaria, they are non-Jews, are converted because of their encounter with Jesus and uh, through this woman. So he, Jesus leaves, he comes back into the region of Cana and Galilee. This man hears that Christ has come. He's heard that Jesus has performed some miracles. Christ is not yet widely known for his healing miracles. Matter of fact, this is recorded as the second miracle. First one being turning the water to wine. So Jesus doesn't have a big reputation for doing signs and wonders yet. And this man has a boy who was sick when Jesus first came to town and now he's real sick and the physicians have given him up for dead. So this man, you know, love sort of makes you desperate. He was a little cynical about if Jesus was the Messiah. He had heard rumors coming from the Jordan River that he had been declared the Messiah. And he thought, well look, I've got to do something. And it's a little journey from where he's going in Capernaum to Cana. He's got to leave his son and see if he can persuade this itinerant rabbi to come to his home and perhaps he could perform a miracle and heal his son. And evidently he's doing some negotiating with God on the way. Have you ever negotiated with God? Lord, you do this for me and I'll do this. And in his heart he's thinking, if Jesus will heal my boy, Father, I'll accept that he's your son and that he is the Messiah, the Christ. But if he doesn't, I'll know he's just a, a fraud. And it says in John 4, verse 46, So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made water to wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. This is a little ways from Cana. And when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him. He managed to get an audience. People probably parted for him because of his high station. And he implored him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. He was terminal. And Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders you will by no means believe. Right away Jesus peeled bare what was going on in his mind and in his heart that he had conditions for his faith. What's in it for me? What will you do for me? I'll do you a big favor God, I'll believe in you if you do something for me. And I've had that talk with the Lord many times. I'm tempted to say, oh Lord, if you'll do this, I want this so bad, I'll do this. And I said, Lord, do you want me making promises I'll be tempted to break? And then, then I'm in bigger trouble than ever. I said, you know what I want. I'll do my best to do your will in whatever area, but I'm not making any vows. And I think God would prefer we're honest with him. If you heal my son, and he's looking for a sign, is it all bad to seek for a sign? Did Jesus use signs? Yeah, Acts chapter 2, verse 22. That's easy to remember. Acts 2.2.2. 2, 2, 2. You men of Israel... Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves know. And even Jesus one time said, John 10 verse 37, 
If I do not the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you don't believe me, believe the works that you might know and believe that the Father is in me. The Lord is saying, look, my word ought to be powerful enough, but if you're not going to believe that, at least look at the evidence in the miracles and the signs. What would the Lord prefer? That we make our decisions based on all kinds of supernatural signs and miracles and evidence or because he says so in his word and we have absolute confidence in his word. You know the parable in, in the Bible of the rich man and Lazarus? In that parable you've got um, this rich man who represents the Jewish nation and you've got uh, Lazarus who represents the Gentiles and the rich man is feasting like the those who have the truth, and this applies to the church today, feasting on the truth, full of it, in abundance, clothed in purple. And the poor beggar, the Gentiles, are desiring the crumbs of truth that fell from the table of the Israelites. Well, both the beggar and the rich man die, and the rich man is up in Abraham's bosom, and uh, the, the, no, I'm sorry, the rich man is in Hades. I want to get my parable straight. This is Luke 19, verse 16. And poor Lazarus now is in Abraham's bosom. And what's interesting about this parable is all of the Jews believed that they would be with Abraham in the kingdom. The beggars believed that the evil would be in Hades, the Greek place. Jesus uses for this illustration, it's a parable, the Greek understanding of where the lost go and the Jewish understanding of where the saved go and he contrasts them in one story and he says the Jew is going to where the Greeks lost go and the Greek poor man is going to where the Jews saved place is. You see the great switch here? He's trying to illustrate something. And so then the rich man begins to talk to Abraham from Hades. He says, Father Abraham, I'm tormented in this flame. Send Lazarus that he might cool my tongue. And he says, you know, that, that's not allowed. There's a great gulf fixed. We can't trade sides anymore. He said, at least send him to my father's house because I've got five brethren that he might warn them of this place. And you know what he says? Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. What does that mean? They've got the Bible, the Word of God. Moses was dead at this point. The prophets were dead. It was talking about the Word of God, the law and the prophets. He said, oh, no, not, not Moses and the prophets, he said, but if someone should rise from the dead, they need a sign. They need a miracle. Then they'll believe. Now the main purpose of that uh, parable is in the last words where Jesus said, Abraham said to the rich man in Hades, if they do not believe Moses and the prophets, then neither will they be persuaded though one should rise from the dead, though they see this great miracle. You notice who was it that wanted the miracle? It was the Jewish nation, the church. Now are we at risk of being exposed? There might be some here that you make deals with God. The Lord loves you. He's proven how much He loves you because He died for you. And so whenever you ask for a sign and a wonder, you say, you know what you're saying? You're saying, God, I want more than your sacrifice of your life as proof. Well, that's kind of pushing the envelope. I did that once. Uh, you've heard me tell the story when I quit smoking I quit several times I struggled with it and uh, one day what finally did it for me I was driving an old terrible dilapidated pickup truck I used to have to always park this truck on a hill because I was always push starting it so whenever I parked it I had to park thinking about how much grade is there here to jump start it I mean it was just an, it was a terrible truck and they had just come out with the new Nissan four-wheel drive pickup trucks, which, oh, I wanted one of those so bad. And so I'm, I'm telling the Lord this, and in my enthusiasm, I said, Lord, if you'd give me a truck like that, I'll quit smoking. <laughs> and I mean it. And I heard a voice say to me, you mean it's not enough that I gave my son for you, you want a pickup truck? And I thought, oh, I was overcome with such a terrible sense of selfishness and shame that I would ever do something like that. That I'd make a deal with God. He gives his life for me. And I said, I want a pickup truck. Not enough that you gave your son. I want a truck. I went home. I threw away my cigarettes. And by the grace of God, I've never smoked again. 
And so there's power enough just in the Word of God. So when you start saying, Lord, I need a sign, be careful. Are, is your whole religion about what's in it for me? Lord, what are you going to do for me? Can the devil work miracles and signs? Well, I think we all know he can. We talked a moment ago about when Moses finally did go in before the Pharaoh and you had the Pharaoh's magicians. Exodus 7, verse 10 to 12. Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did just as God commanded and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, before his servants. It became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers and magicians of Egypt and in like manner they cast down their rods and through their enchantments they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed theirs. Jesus says, especially in the last days, keep in mind, friends, there will be false Christs and false prophets that will show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, the very elect. He says, I'm telling you ahead of time so you know. In 2 Corinthians 11, 14, And for no wonder Satan himself can transform himself into an angel of light, therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. So in the last days, can we expect to see that there will be some false prophets and false miracles and signs and wonders? One quick way to know if a prophet is a prophet of God is if they invoice you for their prophecy, be careful. When you call for your prophecy and they say, can I have your credit card, please? I can almost guarantee you that anybody that's going to make you get involved in 18% interest is not a prophet of God. What about signs? What are they for? Why does God do signs? Well, I got a theory about this. I think signs are principally for unbelievers. It was pretty miraculous when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the disciples during Pentecost, and you find this in Acts chapter 2, and all of a sudden they're miraculously speaking about the wonderful works of God in languages they had never heard. Paul speaking about the gift of tongues, he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 22, so then tongues are a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is for a sign, that's the word of God, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. You see how this works? You have confidence in the Bible. What's going to move you and impress you is when I say, it's in the Bible. Prophecy is the word of God. Law and the Prophets. But when you get an unbeliever who comes in off the street and they don't really have any confidence in the Bible, sometimes God in His mercy trying to get their attention, He works miracles for those people who are baby Christians to say, I really am God, as they're developing confidence in prophecy. As their faith in the Word of God grows, you'll notice that God often weans them from the miracles. He did that for me the majority of miraculous things that God did in my life, I'm sure there's a lot I don't know about or can't remember, but some real prominent ones stood out when I was coming from my convoluted religious background or atheistic background and began to transition into being a Christian, wondering if it was true, wondering if the Bible was dependable. Wow! I was seeing miracles and answered prayers that were just so phenomenal to me that I knew without a doubt the Bible must be true. Uh, I mean, I can go down the road. I got this friend I'm witnessing to. His name was Doug Price. And we're panhandling for food. And I was telling him about all the miracles Jesus is doing for me. And I had such simple childlike faith back then. He said, well, I kind of believe in God, but I'm not so sure about Jesus. And I believe in Buddha and all these things. I said, no, it's not Buddha, it's Jesus. He said, well, you know, how do you know that? I said, let me prove it to you. I said, how much money do we need to get a meal right now? We're panhandling. I play the flute, he played the guitar. He said, well, $4 would be nice. We could both eat. That's back when you could buy a meal for two bucks at a restaurant. I said, all right. And I prayed a real simple prayer. I said, Jesus, Doug doesn't really believe you're real. Give us four dollars right now so he'll know. And so we started playing. This lady comes walking up the street. And she stops for a minute and she listens to us. She's a dignified looking lady in Palm Springs. And so we stopped with our little whatever we were playing. Probably wasn't very good. And we said, ma'am, would you spare some, do you have any spare change? We're trying to get something to eat. She said, oh, she looked taken back by that. And she said, well, you know, normally I don't do this, but today's my son's birthday and he's about your age. How would four dollars do? I said, Doug looked at me and his mouth went open. <laughs> and, but that was happening all the time. 
But you know what's happened is as my confidence in the word matures and grows, I began to become ashamed that I would ask for signs. You remember one time Isaiah went to King Amos and he says, what sign shall the Lord give you? And he said, I'm not going to tempt the Lord by asking for a sign. The king knew better than that. And signs, you know, sometimes they're not that dependable. You, you, people aren't really converted by signs. That's why Jesus said they won't be converted though one should rise from the dead. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, a man named Lazarus did die. Jesus resurrects a man named Lazarus and did the Jewish people believe or did they want to kill Lazarus and Jesus? Conversions that are based upon signs are generally very shallow. You, you with me? A sign, a wonder, a miracle might be a starting point but you better get your anchor into something more firm than the, the, the jello of signs and wonders because first of all you're surrounded with miracles every day these are just the ones you happen to notice most of the miracles 99% of the miracles God has done for you you aren't even aware of it we're surrounded by them you know we need to go back to our story about the man the nobleman back in John chapter 4 so he comes to Jesus and he wants his son healed his son is terminal sir come down before my child dies and he said, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. When that father fell before Christ and he realized that Jesus had laid bare the conditions in his heart, the criteria that he was setting up for God, he said, you know, in order for him to know what I was thinking on my way here, in order for him to read my heart, he had to be God. And you know what one of the great signs is for us that God is real? It's the Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts is that he can read our hearts and he falls before the Lord says come down before my son dies I believe in you he surrendered and Jesus said okay that's all I wanted was your faith and your surrender you believe I don't even need to go he's healed right now the father did not argue and say oh well, just as backup why don't you come or can I get a second opinion from another prophet he took his word and he went home because it was a little distance from Cana to Capernaum and that father's heart was light he knew matter of fact he didn't even rush home he was thinking about the Messiah thinking about God it took him till the next day to get there and if you look at a map it didn't need to take that long he took his time going home because he knew his son was healed you know what uh, this is I think a wonderful story kind of like that centurion servant you remember when uh, he came to Jesus and said, can you heal my servant? And the Lord said, okay, I'll come. He says, look, you don't need to come. I've got faith in you. He said, uh, I'm a man with others working under me and uh, we delegate and I say to one go and he goes, another one come, he comes and uh, I believe you have this power. You don't need to come to speak the word. My servant will be healed. And Jesus stopped in his tracks and his mouth fell open and he turned and he announced to all the Jews that were listening to him, I have not seen such faith, no, not in Israel. And many will come from the east and the west and sit down in the kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the children of the kingdom will be cast out. Christ was saying, look, this is a Gentile. He's not asking for a miracle. He's got more faith. He doesn't even need me to go. Here you've got the nobleman. He says, you need to come to my house. The Roman says, just say the word, I believe. You know, it's often true that some who are not in the church they got more faith. They say, well, if your God's a God and He's all-powerful, then He can do anything. They've got that simple faith. And in the same chapter, did the Samaritans ask for a sign and a wonder before they believed in Jesus? But you know, the Jews came to Jesus and they said, what sign will you perform that we might believe? And He said, it's an evil and adulterous generation, speaking of the church, that seeks after a sign. So what do we do with signs and wonders and miracles? Well, let me tell you, I think as we mature in our own lives, we're not going to need God to prove things to us. We're going to take His Word. Matter of fact, I think as you mature, you know, I don't want to scare you, but instead of saying, I've got enough faith that you're going to give me what I want, you're going to be praying, Lord, I've got enough faith to do your will even if it's not what I want. Jesus showed perfect maturity when at the end He says, Lord, I want your will, not what I want. So often we say, Lord, I'll believe if you give me what I want. 
You're showing you've grown if you say, no sign, no wonder, just your word, and I want to do your will. Whether or not it's what I want. If you believe that Jesus came for you, that's enough. And you know what the real sign is? The greatest sign, the greatest wonder, is if he changes your heart. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with this week's special offer. Pride is the dragnet in which the devil catches the most Christians. If God gives you a measure of success, then thank him for it. But compliments and success are like perfume. They're to sniff and not to swallow. He that exalted himself the most will be humbled the most. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. For thousands of years, man has worshipped God on the seventh day of the week. Now, each week, millions of people worship on the first day. What happened? Why did God create a day of rest? Does it really matter what day we worship? Who is behind this great shift? Discover the truth behind God's law and how it was changed. Visit SabbathTruth.com. It's time to impact your life, your world, for Jesus Christ. Get the new, challenging, brain-stimulating resource from Dr. Neil Nedley in The Lost Art of Thinking. Or try the brand new Prophecy Foundations DVD featuring 50 hours of video teaching with Pastor Doug Batchelor, even more audio files, and 48 complete books. Save huge right now on life and world-impacting resources at store.amazingfacts.org, your online Christian bookstore. Many of us have asked this age-old question to God. Please, Lord, show me a sign. We often do this on the verge of making a major life decision, the person we should marry, a job or career choice. Many students will ask for miracles before a test. Most religions today teach about a coming day of reckoning and rescuing, a day when the problems of this world will be forgotten. The Bible teaches about a day coming soon when the Savior of the Scriptures will show himself and take his followers with him. This is not a fairy tale or a legend, but a real source of comfort and hope for millions. The questions of, would I be saved, and how will I know the signs are important ones. We would like to offer you a wonderful study guide entitled, The Last Night on Earth. This study guide will share some practical steps to having a joyful Christian life and how to be always ready. Thank you for joining us. See you next time. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. Preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Through the Bible, God often uses them to demonstrate His power. Deuteronomy 24, verse 10. But since then there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Have you ever prayed you could see God face to face? In all the signs and wonders which He did, when he sent him to the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all the land by that mighty power and all the great terror that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. You know, miracles, of course, are when you see something extraordinary or unusual out of the ordinary happen that seems to violate the regular laws of um, science and uh, probability. But really, we're surrounded by miracles all the time. Someone once said, the world is not lacking in wonders. We're lacking in a sense of wonder. It's amazing when you think about all the cars that you drive by and what people do in their cars that you make it anywhere safely. <laughs> I mean, we're just surrounded by the evidence of God's protection. Now, is it wrong to want to see miracles? Well... Have you ever prayed you could see an angel? Be honest. 
Have you ever thought, Lord, people in the Bible saw angels. People in the Bible saw miracles. I, I want more faith. If I could see more miracles, I'd have more faith. Lord, just a little miracle. And that's kind of normal, I think, for us to sometimes want that. I didn't see very much response, but I'm guessing some of you have thought that way. Come on, help me out. How many of you have thought that before? Have you prayed, Lord, could I see an angel? Gideon had the same challenge. When the angel appeared to Gideon, and he called him a mighty man of God, he said, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, then why has all this befallen us? They were being subjugated by the Midianites. And where are all the miracles that our fathers told us of? I always like this verse where Gideon says, What happened to all the miracles? Have you ever thought today, I read about all these miracles in the Bible, where'd they all go? Did God stop doing miracles? Did the store close? What happened to all the miracles? And here you've got Gideon, who lives before the miracles of Elijah and Jesus and the apostles, and he says, I guess the age of miracles is over. So evidently, miracles and signs and wonders seem to come in cycles and in waves. Did God do some miracles for Gideon? And then Gideon, of course, he not only saw some miracles, he asked for signs. The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. What would the Lord prefer? That we make our decisions based on all kinds of supernatural signs and miracles and evidence or because He says so in His Word and we have absolute confidence in His Word? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Our message today is going to be on the subject of signs and wonders. Miracles, signs and wonders are all before he was going to take this little group into battle uh, against a massive force he said Lord I don't want to go on a suicide mission and just be hallucinating thinking I heard you speak to me I really want to know before I lead all these men into battle and risk their lives this is what you want and that's where you got the, the story and by the way you read about this in Judges 6 verse 37 through 40 of the fleece I want a sign Lord it's a big decision so I'm going to throw out a fleece, and a fleece, of course, is the sheepskin. And he rolled it out on the ground. They probably used it as bedding. And he said, you know, I'm going to pray the first time, and in the morning, if the dew is on the fleece but not on the ground, I'll take that as a sign from you. So God did it for him. And then he thought, well, maybe that was a natural occurrence, and it wasn't really a miracle. Have you ever wondered, is something a sign from God, or was it just a coincidence of nature? <laughs> 